Simple Solutions to Fix Healthcare in America podcast. Each week, we explore bipartisan solutions to healthcare reform through discussions with leading experts from across the country. To learn more, go to purplesolutions.org and join us at our Healthcare Economic Summit on July 31st. Hi, I'm Dan Sam. I'm here today with Dr. Stephen Clasco, President and CEO of Thomas Jefferson University and Jefferson Health. Dr. Clasco was named one of modern healthcare's top 100 most influential people and was recently named the first distinguished fellow uh, of the World Economic Forum at Davos, Switzerland. And most importantly to me uh, is that he is our keynote speaker at the July 31st Healthcare Economic Summit here in Wisconsin, which is scheduled strategically two weeks before the Democratic National Convention because we want to stimulate a dialogue, an informed dialogue about healthcare reform. So Steve, thanks so much for speaking with me today uh, and also for our summit on July 31st. Uh, so you are really at the cutting edge of healthcare innovation and disruption through your work at Thomas Jefferson. And you've also written some great, really uh, entertaining books, surprisingly entertaining. Not surprising that you're entertaining, but surprising that you can make talking about healthcare economics. Surprising that a doctor would write something other than about himself, right? I yes. <laughs> Um, quite a few books you've written. Um, this is the one that I wanted to talk a little bit about today, so how to fix healthcare. Uh, although you hit on this topic in some of your other books, you talk about 12 disruptions, um, and I love this quote. You can blame Trump, you can blame Obama, uh, or you can decide it's all up to us, all of us. And that's kind of the theme for the summit that we're doing on July 31st, which is before the DNC. We're hoping to get a discussion about bipartisan approaches to healthcare reform. And I noticed you have the, the donkey and the elephant shaking hands, which is sort of hard to imagine. <laughs> yeah, it was funny because Sanjay Gupta had, had done a thing on this because uh, the whole theory of the book was that President Obama, before he left, got all of us together in the healthcare ecosystem and said, look, just figure it out. <laughs> and we started out just doing what we do best. We blamed everybody that wasn't us. The providers right. blamed the insurers, insurers blamed pharma. And what happened, as with most of my books, there was a science fiction event, a blackout. And after that blackout, all you could do was look in the mirror. So the pharma exec had to say, gosh, actually, actually we're screwing up the system. We could change this. And the, the CEO of a hospital system said, no, actually, we could do this. Okay. And, and so, so the first chapter was, you know, 2016 when politics and healthcare became fun again. So Sanjay said, so you know it's a science fiction book, which <laughs> is, is true given what's happened. Look, I, I think here, here's, here's what people are missing. It's not rocket science. And, and so one of my mentors, a guy named Bill Kissick, who was my, one of my professors at Wharton, he wrote a book 40 years ago, Dan, 40 years ago, called, Med called Medicine's Dilemmas, Infinite Needs, Finite Resources. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. And 40 years ago, he talked about the Iron Triangle of Access, Quality, and Cost. And 40 years ago, he said, if you're going to increase access, you either have to increase cost or decrease quality, unless you're willing to disrupt the system and disruption is painful. And he said 40 years ago, if anybody ever tells you that they're going to increase access, increase quality, and decrease cost, and it's not going to be disruptive or painful, they're alive. So okay. just think about this. If you want to know health policy in a nutshell, without being overtly political, it's this. The last 12 years, what have we had? President Obama said, good news. The Affordable Care Act's going to increase access, increase quality, and decrease cost, and it's not going to be painful. Well, that was clearly a lie mathematically. Yeah. President Trump got in there and said, well, mine's going to be terrific, unbelievable, and huge. Uh, but clearly <laughs> that wasn't true either. So the fact is that what we have done in this country is look at more and more ways to pay for a fragmented, expensive, inequitable, and occasionally unsafe healthcare delivery system. So why have we done that? The reason we've done it is to actually change the system. It's not complicated. We just don't have the courage to change it. We require four or five things, all of which have extensive lobbyists against them happening. One would be, there is no industry in the world, and this or any other planet, where if you're gonna decrease costs, if the whole idea of the Affordable Care Act was to get a dollar and a quarter of care down to a dollar, so we can give more access, then what are the first, what are the first stocks you would have sold? You would have looked at every other industry that got disrupted like Amazon. And, oh shit, I better, I better 
sell all my all my middleman stocks. I'm going to sell the insurers. Yeah. I'm going to sell United stock. Well, that would have been a big mistake because United Healthcare Aetna went up around ten times since since the Affordable Care Act. And then you would have said, well, supplies have got to get cheaper. So I'm going to sell my PBM and my and my um, pharma stocks. Well, that would have been a bigger mistake because they went up 12 or 13 times. So think about this. If you're trying to create a more efficient system and your middle is exploding and your supply chain is exploding, you can't, I think the pandemic has proven that. It, it's a broken system. So that's one. Yeah. Second thing is we're the only country in the world that doesn't deal with end of life issues. So in every other country, there's a rational view to end of life. Mm -hmm. In this country, if your great uncle Frank is 93 years old, has had three strokes and is intubated, and he now goes into acute renal failure, there's a lot of people making a lot of money called DeVita, Fresenius, the nephrologist, the hospital, to, to, give him, um, to give him dialysis for another few weeks. And by the way, you're not paying for it because Medicare or Medicaid. <laughs> So that's an impossible situation. We're the only country in the world, or probably any other planet, that pays its dermatologists 10 times what it pays its family docs, and then asks the family docs to quarterback the system. So, so that's clearly got to change. We're the only country in the world that goes to pharma and say, oh, don't worry, we'll pay you retail costs for all your pharma for the largest insurer, which is CMS, because we, we don't want you to have to worry about discounting. So again, the reason I bring those up is those are not complicated things. It's just that we haven't wanted to do it. And that was a failure of the last two or three administrations. I fault, I fault President Obama in some respects at a greater level because he for the first time had the mandate to make that change. Mm -hmm. And if you think back to the negotiations around the ACA, I think he sort of wanted to have a, a more of a change and sort of got, got sort of compromised into, you know, well, we don't want to upset pharma because then they won't support the Democrats and we don't want to upset the end of life people. And we ended up with this sort of very C plus bill that yeah. still did some good things. So to me, so, so that's the issue. So what, 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 I have, what I have espoused just real quickly is we need a 9-11 commission for healthcare. Because if, any, if the pandemic has proven anything is we have a huge existential crisis in this country around healthcare. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need, we're now going to have hospitals going bankrupt. We're going to have people being unemployed. Oh, yeah. not going to get health care. We have all these we're people already at a tipping point and now more so. Exactly. It was going to happen anyhow. This was this tipping point. So just like 9-11, it wasn't like terrorism didn't exist before 9-11, but it proved that we were at that tipping point. And what yeah. happened? At first, the Democrats blamed the Republicans, and then the Republicans blamed the Democrats. Eventually, they got together and said, we failed to keep the country safe. We need this pandemic to be... Democrats and Republicans saying, you know what, we don't have a clue. We have failed to solve this problem. Let's get some really, really smart people, just like they did in this book, maybe without the science fiction event, <laughs> and say, look, your job, if you're the CEO of Pharma and we put you on this commission, or somebody like me, the CEO of hospital, is to not talk about what other people can do. What can you do to solve yeah. this problem? What are you willing to give at the office? And I don't want you to come back to me till you have a very transformed system. To me, that if, if we could do that now, the idea behind the 12 disruptors is fascinating in this science fiction world. What happened when that happened was 12 disruptors for the demise of the old healthcare. And it was so powerful that both the Democrats and Republicans used it as the same platform. They called it different, different things. One was called the decisive- The miracle that you accomplished there. Democratic <laughs> thing, the other was called the Republican Revolution, whatever it was. And the only difference was how it was paid for, because that's what they're always doing. Yeah. One, Democrats were government will pay for, the other was, but, but, they, but they agreed on the 12 things. And what was fascinating about it, when I wrote the book, I met with Hillary Clinton's um, uh, head of healthcare uh, for her campaign. And I met with, at that time, Jared Kushner was sort of the head of everything. And, um, you, know, um, you know, I would say they agreed on about eight of the 12. So it wasn't that, that science fiction. Well, <clears throat> okay, so there's a lot of stuff there to kind of unpack, and, and, you know, and I think disruption is needed. I, I think that's one thing that I really like about you and what you write about and why I think you have a big following. I, I was talking about disruption to a healthcare executive in Milwaukee, and, and he told me, he said, Dan, stop using that word. It makes us nervous. I'm like, maybe it should. <laughs> so, 
but I, but I kind of want to get at you know from from your point of view, uh, how do we how do we do that disruption when there are such strong lobby groups protecting the different industries that need to be disrupted? And I, I'm kind of drawn to a couple things. One of which is COVID, which is disrupting things now already and pushing us out of our comfort zone. But the first thing is, is you talk about consumerizing and the consumer revolution and you know i look at uber and, and maybe that's not a good example but there were regulatory barriers or all kinds of barriers getting in the way and they just pushed through because there were so many consumers that were empowered what do you mean by consumer revolution and could that drive the disruption if somehow consumers you know embraced some of what you're talking about yeah yeah look i think there's a, there's a few ways you know if you just look at, at, at other other industries there's a few ways that things can really transform. One is you reach a point where people just say, I'm mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore. Yeah. And, um, and especially if they're given alternatives. And I think we're already starting to see that. Um, you know, you have things like One Medical and some of these things are saying, we're, it used to be, I would go to HIMSS, you know, the big uh, healthcare information management thing. And I have 870 25 year olds tell me how they're transforming healthcare and they, they wanna take their app onto my system. Now I have those same 25 year olds saying, we're ignoring you guys, you're, you're Sears and pennies. We're gonna come into your community and do it. And you're, you're seeing that in a lot of different ways. So the think issue they're gonna is, do it? Yeah, well, I think they are. Yeah, I think they're already starting to, to, to be successful. I mean, so what it comes down to, if, if somebody says, um, you are nuts to get on the phone with some 11 options to get a dermatology appointment three weeks from now, when you can go on and I can get you a really good board of certified dermatologist that can see you at three o'clock today. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I, th I think that, that people will say, well, wait, why am I doing that? Yeah. And we've already started to see that with urgent care. So that, that, that's one way. The second, the, the, the second way is that you have something like this, like COVID, where it forces people into a different model, like telehealth and that kind of thing, that, that people say, well, wait, why, why did I go to the emergency room again? So, so uh, you know, I'll give you an example. I'm working with a, uh, a pregnancy company called Nuvo, which is basically doing, uh, I'm an obstetrician, uh, doing uh, remote monitoring for, um, uh, for the kind of things you'd have to come into the hospital three times a week. Mm -hmm. Now think about that. Think about a 26 year old who's pregnant, who, who is healthy. And now let's say it's this fall or even a year from now or two years from now. She's going to go, let me get this straight, Steve. You want me to drive into Philadelphia to your hospital three times a week to pay $35 to park, go into a place where there's a lot of sick people, get on an elevator. I'm going to put me in a room, slap a monitor on me that 10 other people have had that day um, so I can stare at the ceiling and have a nurse come and tell me I'm okay. When I could be at home, binge watching little fires everywhere uh, with, a, with a glass of lemonade and do the same thing with Nuvo. Yeah. But I think, I think, you know, as you start to create alternatives, you know, the Friday after Thanksgiving, there were no alternatives. You had to get up early, go to the parking lot, fight the crowds, and beat somebody up for a Cabbage Patch doll. <laughs> then all of a sudden, you know, eBay and Amazon came, and you didn't have to do that anymore. It doesn't mean you can't. People still, still you know, go, go to retail, but you had to adapt. So, that, so that's the second way. Um, and I think you'll start to see so, so the, the disruptors, some of the, that. And then I think the, the, the third way is just, um, I think what you'll start to see is some sane um, opportunities where smart legislators will realize exactly your point about Uber or banking, that we have to, that we have to allow some of these things to expand. Mm -hmm. I, I just met with two of our senators and I explained to them that what's held telehealth back is that every guild society, and it's not the state legislature's fault, it's the medical societies of the state that don't want me coming from Pennsylvania or Jeff Connect going to their state. Yeah. They create these barriers. I think I can physically practice in 48 out of 50 states, but I can't do telehealth in more than 14. That's asinine. Now, didn't and COVID kind of lift that regulatory well, barrier, at least temporarily? Temporarily, temporarily yeah. depends on what happens. So it comes back. So, so, the, so the question becomes, if you needed a different ATM card for every state with a different code, banking would, would have gotten to where it is. So I think, yeah. I think you'll see the, com the confluence of a man is held, I'm not going to take it anymore. 
disruptors coming in and saying, we're going to ignore the traditional healthcare ecosystem. And people say, well, this is a lot easier than going to my hospital. And then I think the third thing is you'll start to see some, some um, sane, I think, um, uh, policy around promoting these technologies yeah. that, will, that will lead to that. I mean, that has to be driven by the consumer, or the patient, right? So do you think that now that people have seen how convenient telehealth is and things like that, they're going to they're gonna demand it more and, and maybe some of these barriers? I mean, I guess I'm wondering, what are the barriers? Is, yeah. There's a the licensure, well, there's the HIPAA requirements for medical records. Well, look, look, the barriers are we are not built. The, the healthcare system in the United States is built. I mean, look, I, here's, here's how I put it. The pandemic has proven that Bernie Sanders was 100.0% right about the problem and 100.0% wrong about the solution. What I mean by that is when he talks about the fact that this system is not built for people or patients, it's built to make a lot of different folks a lot of money in pharma, in providers, in insurers, and it's built around this lack of transparency yeah. so those people can make money in the three card Monty way. And we've had this thing in our, in, in, in our country that it's okay that 25% of the population has to mortgage their house or be on Medicaid. Uh, and the other 75% will just keep charging the employers more. And, you know, it's this nice little show game. So he's right about the problem. He gets an A for that. He gets an F for, and I think the pandemic has proved this. I got an idea. Let's have government solve it because they've done a hell of a job between the, the, the coordination between the federal and the state states around running this pandemic. And you certainly don't want them running healthcare. So, so look, I think that the, that the answer is, I think we will create a new generation. My, my new book, which will be out in two weeks, is called Unhealthcare, A Manifesto for Health Assurance. And, and it goes from saying, let's stop talking about health insurance. Let's talk about health assurance. 98% mm -hmm. of the people are not patients. 98% of the people are people like you and I who are people who want to be able to thrive without health getting in the way. We become a patient, hopefully, for the very short periods of our life where we have problems. And even pregnant people, again, getting back to my other example, not view themselves as patients. They, they view themselves as pregnant people you know, yes. <laughs> who, who have a, who are having a, a hopefully normal life event. So, so I think they will start to I think there will start to be this consumerization of like, you know, why am I putting up with this? And I think some of, of my campaign, Daniel, has been to try to get people to have, and it sounds bad, but a little less respect for the system. Um, so I wrote this article that imagine this got me in a lot of trouble because I said, in some respects we have too much, we, 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 we hold too much respect for our doctors. What I meant was not our abilities, but if you have an eight o'clock appointment, and your doctor comes in at 8.45, 95% of the time you're gonna go, that's okay, Dr. Clasco, you probably had an emergency. And what I said in that article is that's true, dot, 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 about 12% of the time. <laughs> the, 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 the other percent of the time is I was doing something else. It doesn't mean that I didn't care, but I was uh, grand rounds or whatever, but I knew I would get excused. Yeah where if I was in any other industry and I did that routinely, the patient would have left, the person would have left, the client would have left. Have more accountability to right. your customer. Right. Right. <laughs> and, and, and once you get people to realize that, you know, in most places, other than very rural areas, you know, the person that is doing your pap smear or checking out your ankle, you know, did not come down from heaven and is the only one that can do that. <laughs> that that you know there's there's lots of folks that have the same amount of ability to handle your 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 ACL repair or your you know or your um you know your your gynecologic problem um, um for me it's kidney or your, stones or, or, or your kidney stone problem and if they're not nice and you're not able to get in to see them go to somebody else yeah just go to somebody else. Uh, you know, it's, but it's so it's hard to do that nowadays. You got to make sure it's approved with your plan. And, well, and then there's well, this whole concept well, of leakage. Again, like you can't go out of network. And it's like, how do I go to somebody else? Yeah. It, well, it's funny that you put leakage in the, in the same category as kidney stones. Cause one could argue that that's <laughs> there you go. in neurology. But um, <laughs> um, look, I, th I think that, that, that we have to defragment the system. 
you're right. You know, what, think about what you're saying. The reason I can't do that is because the system has made it so hard for me to do that. Yeah. So, so why should I even try? Right. You know, if, if the system said, you know what, if you're going to do your holiday shopping, not go to Sears and Pennies, we're going to make you go through 12 different hoops to buy that product on Amazon. Sears and Pennies would still be booming and Amazon wouldn't have made it. Yeah. So, so yeah, what, 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 what you've allowed to happen, what health policy is allowed to happen is to us to create this shell game. When I say us, the insurers, we'll start with them, but the insurers, the providers and others to say, yeah, you know, don't you dare think that, that this could ever become a consumer thing because, you know, you know, then you'd have to get permission. Yeah. And why? Why? I mean, I, I just want you to take a step back and say, if you, if you, we're going to create, remember those old games, Sim Life and Sim, mm -hmm. Sim City? If you're going to create Sim Healthcare and make the most messed up healthcare system, this is what you would do. <laughs> you'd say, people, you're going to go see something called a doctor or a nurse. Okay, I get that. They have the expertise to take care of you. Okay, so let me get this straight. So then when I see that person, he or she will send me a bill. Oh, no. What will happen is your employer or your government will say, don't worry your pretty little head about that. We'll take care of that. Oh, so your government or employer, you're going to negotiate with my doctor. I get that. Oh, no. I'm going to negotiate with this third party called an insurer. They like to call themselves payers, but they're really not because we're the payers, the employer, government. <laughs> and, and so what we're going to do is negotiate. Again, you're not going to have anything to do with it, nor is your doctor. We're going to set all the rules, what lab and everything else. And then let, let's make this a little more messed up. You're going to go to the doctor. Let's say you have a procedure done. You're not going to know anything about what it costs or anything about what the doctors deal with, with the insurer, really, yeah. nor is the employer. And you're not really going to know what your deal is with the insurer and the employer. The doctor won't know either. <laughs> and Right. Nobody will know anything. Yeah. Two weeks later, you're going to get this 27-page thing for a ridiculous <laughs> amount of money. Yeah. On the top saying, and it's going to look a hell of a lot like a bill. It's going to say, this is not a bill. <laughs> and you're going to say, then why the heck did you send it to me and aggravate it? Yeah, with some scary numbers in there. And you go say, this is not a bill, scary numbers. This must be a Saturday Night Live thing. I'm okay. going gonna, I'm gonna to rip it up. Then four weeks later, you get a bill with almost no explanation of what you owe, which is a lot less than the ridiculous, this is not a bill. Yeah. But you also had no control over it. And you might say, gosh, I thought I had a $100 deductible. Why is that $400? Oh after 11 options and waiting on the phone for 30 minutes, the insurer will say, oh, that's because your doctor didn't go to the insurance, to the a lab that we chose yeah. because we get those lab services less expensive. So, I mean, you know, I, I know it sounds like I'm being flip about this, but you couldn't have created a more <laughs> fragmented system. And as long as money is unlimited, as long as we're willing to use more and more and more of our GDP for healthcare, yeah. without any better results, as long as we're willing not to provide access to everybody, then that works. Yeah. At the point that it breaks, and I think that, I think that this RNA encapsulated virus will be that break because hospitals are losing $60 billion a month in this country. Yeah. You know, insurers, in some cases, have done better because they got all their money up front. The government can't continue to just keep shelling out dollars to keep an inefficient system. More people are unemployed, so they're gonna have to mortgage their house to pay for um, for cancer care or go on or go on Medicaid. So I think you're gonna hit that I'm mad as hell and not gonna take it anymore. Moment. Yeah, really. I think so. I mean, nobody's happy about COVID and it's, it is like you say, breaking the system. But I think there was yeah. gonna be a painful break that took years and maybe it's gonna happen fast and we can get to something better. So, cause it's just, it, it's like that adoption curve. It's pushing yeah. us all out of our comfort zone. It, now that it, we're it out of that, yeah. what are we going to do? <laughs> yeah, it, it won't happen fast, but I think, I think you're right about the sigmoid curve. It'll start to accelerate. Look, I, you know, our, our, my, most exciting, my most exciting things I'm doing at Jefferson are these relationships with venture capitalists that are finally recognizing that our model of creating fast and breaking things isn't working and your model of keeping things the way they were you know 50 years ago isn't working why don't we get together so the beginning of our new book which is written by myself and hey montanasia who's the managing principal of general catalyst 
the guys that invested in Airbnb and Livongo and others, you mm -hmm. know, starts out. So a Silicon Valley entrepreneur and a CEO of a 195 year old academic medical center walk into a bar and dot, dot, dot. Okay. You know, what would happen if there was a reality TV show where a Silicon Valley entrepreneur and a CEO of a, of a, of a traditional 14 hospital academic medical center center got married. I got virtually married and, yeah. and, you know, instead of, you know, we'll create this over here. And that's what's happening with Jefferson GC. They're okay. embedding people into my ecosystem to help solve right. our problems digitally. We're embedding people into their ecosystem so that they're, they're creating things we need, not things that they think would be cool. Um, and, you know, and, and I think that, that 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 will start to make the difference. If you look at Apple, the, the you know, Steve Jobs' brilliance was don't give people what they want. Yeah. You know, you know, get, get people what, they what, what, what they'll want in the future and need in yeah. the future and create it and then explain to them why, why they need it. And I think once you create a different future in healthcare, people will say, well, wh why the heck? You need to make what happens now. If you create alternatives and then some of the things I just brought up will look so ridiculous to people. So they're in your book, you paint this sort of sim world of how things could be, but that's what you're actually trying to do. At, at well, Jefferson. yeah, the nice thing about the new book on healthcare is that's what we're doing. I mean, you know, we, you know, that's the whole idea between, and we actually talk about some companies that have done it. Look, you know, the company that, um, that Haymont started, which is now the largest IPO in healthcare history, um, called Livongo, and we were one of the first clients and, you know, have maintained a co-development agreement. It, it's almost embarrassingly non, it's not like they created the cure for cancer. They took diabetes, which was archaic in how we handled it. As far as let me, you know, let me three times a day dip this little thing into urine, you know, call my doctor, go see the doctor, go to urgent care, and just created, you know, an opportunity with some AI, you know, to do it yourself, mm -hmm. but that exists in every other thing. And then People that use Livongo say, you want me to what? You want me to, you know, dip this thing? Why would I do that when I have Livongo? Well, that turned into a three and a half billion dollar company. You know, so, so I mean, you know, probably more now because the stock's done pretty well. But, um, you know, there's going to be wearables. You're going to go to sleep at night and you're going to basically, you know, you're going you're gonna to know what's going on with yourself. That's health assurance. And are we going to be doing a lot of it through these things and, and yeah. controlling it and navigating it? Well, well, well look. A lot of it through these things, you're going to wake up. I, 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 it hit me one day that my car gets better care than I do. <laughs> my wife has a car that, that while it's in the garage, it sends continuous data. Mm, yeah. So when I wake up and I put, you know, turn on the engine, hey, Steve, while you were sleeping, hope you had a good night's sleep, but while you were sleeping, my right passenger tire got a little flat. So could you take, take me over and get some air in my right passenger tire? Yeah. All right. Now think about how, 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 how you get handled. We're going to have you come for a physical every two years. And on March 27th, 2020, we're going to take your pulse, your blood pressure, your weight, your EKG, maybe your calcium score. And based on that one moment in time, we're going to tell you what to do for the next two years. <laughs> oh, and by the way, if you happen to die in your sleep, because you had a fib that didn't show up that one day. Yeah, that really, that stinks for you, right? You know, so, so at the end of the day, that's what's, that's what's ridiculous. So what you'll have between this and this is you'll wake up in the morning if you have, you know, if you have asthma and you'll go to your HomePod or your Alexa and you'll say, hey, Siri, um, could you play the daily podcast? And Siri will say, yeah, before we do that, your, your wearable was telling me you're late, Breathing was a little labored. Oh, by the way, the AQI is a little sketchy and the pollen count is up. So do me a favor, take an extra inhaler and then I'll play the daily podcast. That's not science fiction. So that's health assurance. That's that healthcare starts with me. I feel really good because I'm going to sleep at night with something that if I did have AFib, you know, and, and that was getting worse, it would alert me so that I could go and get it taken care of instead of, you know, finding out that I didn't wake up. You know, I have an aura ring and, and an Apple watch. Okay, so that's a, the, the, my aura ring tells me exactly what my readiness score is, et cetera. You know, that's gonna, those things are gonna get better and better and better. And you have digital companions around how you're doing. 
So, so what we'll start to have is, is getting away from, you know, again, it, it just makes me laugh because it's a little bit like, put a little mark if you took your pill or go to like CVS and get one of those things where you can check it off to, you know, companies now where literally it has a little marker. And when you take the pill, you know, it shows up on your app. And yeah. if you're supposed to take the pill by, you know, by, you know, you know, noon at noon, you'll get an urgent test text. You didn't take your Ditalizam or you didn't take your Lipitor. Right. I mean, that technology exists. Why wouldn't we do that? You get a, your car gets a warning sign if you're getting low on gas. Yeah. Right. The, the, that comes to my, my, my little app. So again, so I think, I think it can't not happen. It's hard to believe that the most important thing in our life, which is our health, is going to be the only thing that has escaped the consumer revolution. I mean, what are like the big barriers for all of that cool stuff to happen, the wearables and all that, feeding in actionable medical information, you need it to go into something like a medical record and there's all these kind of HIPAA rules and things like that. Are those barriers or are those yeah. not barriers? So? Well, again, it, it, it needs to be disrupted. I mean, when I say yeah. disrupted, you, this whole ridiculous concept of I own your record. And if you're seeing me and then you want to go and see the doctor, you have to come with your tail between your legs. I know. Hey, Dr. Clasco, could you send my records? You'll go to my, my assistant. Could you see my records? Why, you don't like Dr. Clasco? You know, <laughs> let me have you talk to Dr. Clasco. I don't really want to talk to Dr. Clasco. I just want to go see Dr. Sam. Well, you know, well, no, I, I think before we give you the okay, oh, and by the way, we'll charge you to send the records. Again, make that, you wait that, a couple weeks, okay. too. <laughs> so so what needs to happen is you own your records. Yeah. You have a password. If you're seeing Dr. Clasco, you share your password with me. So I, I have all your records. If you decide to stop seeing me and see another doctor, you change your password. Yeah. It's, it's exactly what happens in banking. If, if you go from Bank of America to Wells Fargo, you don't have to go to the CEO of Bank of America and say, could you please transfer my records to, to, to Wells Fargo? You move your money over, your you money. get a different app, <laughs> You know, it, it's in one one click transfer to, to, to your new account. You now have a different app. You, you got you, your bill pay moves over and you're done. That's how, that's how it will be in healthcare. And we've even come up with models where if you get run over by a bus and, you know, we, we don't have a password, the emergency rooms would have, if you will, skeleton passwords that can op open up anybody's cloud. They'd be audited just like any other HIPAA thing. So, you, you know, I would have to prove that the five, sort of keys that I opened up were because people were unconscious or whatever, but that would be no different than schedule, you know, you know, schedule five drugs and those kind of things. So look, it's, it, it all exists. We just, we, we just have to want to do it as the providers and you, you have to demand it. And I think that confluence will happen. Okay. Well, my very last question then, unless there's anything else you want to add is, uh, cause this is before the election. You know, a lot of the vision that you have is cool. I'm excited about it. I'm just wondering if government can help or get out of the way. Like if you had either Joe or Donald in an elevator with you <laughs> and you had a couple of minutes, what would you tell them to point them in a direction yeah. they should or shouldn't go? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, well, there's way too many jokes that could come out of that. Uh, <laughs> but, but look, I, I think... I, I think that uh, what I would say is I think that you've got this, you know, once in a lifetime moment to basically take advantage. And, you know, in some respects, because of the realities of both of them, they both have this very unique thing. Uh, if President Trump wins because he's a disruptive second term president that, you know, like he has no, nobody he has to, not that he does anyhow, but has to kiss up to. So he wouldn't have to worry about the pharma lobby, the insurance lobby, the provider lobby. He really could create this 9-11 commission. And yeah. I would say, look, do it now. Get, I don't care who it is, get the 15 people that you think are like you, that are willing to, you know, push the envelope from pharma, from whatever, whatever, um, and put them in a room for six months and tell them to come back with a transform system that's doable. Okay. If it's if it's Joe Biden, if you know, if it's Vice President Biden, one could argue. I mean, he hasn't said this, 
but the chances are good. And, you know, people have inferred that he might decide to be a one-term president, um, you know, you know, both because of his age and it would give him some more leeway. Yeah. And if that was the case, you know, you know, let's just say for the heck of it, he said, look, you know, now that I've been elected, I'm going to commit to being a one-term president because I really, you know, this country's in trouble and I want to be able to do the things that I need to do. You know, that I think, by the way, his approval rating would go up by about 27 points, you know, uh, if he did that. Um, but, it, you know, if he did that and then said, and because of that, don't come and lobby me. I'm going to, you know, health care is going to be what, I, you know, I'm going to, well, how powerful would it be to say, you know, I sat there and, or I stood there next to President Obama and said, you know, this is a BFD, President Obama, if you remember that moment. Um, and, and it was, but that was just the beginning. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue that legacy and really, really transform healthcare. That would be a very powerful moment. So I think in some respects, because of the two individuals. So that's what I would say. I would say, you know, because of, because of what you are, who you are, and the fact that you're, you know, you're, you're in a situation where this term is really going to matter in a country where people are ready for transformation and are tired of the same old, same old post-COVID. Yeah. You know, go for it. Go, you know, you know, go, go for gold. And don't listen to the people that tell you you can't do this because, you know, pharma will do when Harry met Sally commercials or, you know, insurers will lobby against you. You know, none of that has worked. So go for it. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Well, anything else that you think we should touch on or you want to add or? No, I think I've probably uh, just about upset everybody. So I think, uh, I think <laughs> you're a disruptor. I, 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 I have, <laughs> I, no, look, I think, look, here's what I'd say. I think the one thing I would say is I think we'd be remiss to go through anything like this in May of 2020 without recognizing the absolute heroes uh, uh, that, that, that have been on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic at my health system and every, and everyone else's. And I, and I hope what people understand, just like they did with 9-11 and the firefighters, you know, you know and, and, and the police, they, they didn't just become heroes that day. <laughs> you know, our, our frontline healthcare people put their lives at risk, put their families at risk, you know, every day. Um, and and our nurses, not just our nurses and our doctors, but the people that clean the rooms of, you know, infectious diseases and that kind of thing. It just yeah. became so much more evident during the COVID crisis. So I think, you know, I think as, as messed up as the healthcare delivery system is, healthcare is not messed up. I, I've said this, it comes from Dr. Frieda Lewis, that we have a um, Star Wars healthcare system with a Fred Flintstone healthcare delivery system. <laughs> we, we, we really have great technology. We have great people. We provide great care. Uh, but we have this really archaic way we deliver the system. So that's that's yeah. what I end with. That's a great way to end. So, and I think a lot of the disruptions you're talking about are going to put more power in decision making at the front lines. Yeah, I agree. And, the I agree. And, yeah. and that's what we need.